So thank you everybody for coming. There's just a couple of things that I'd like us to do before we get started. Um, if everybody could just go around, you know, very quickly introduce themselves, uh, maybe tell us where you are, how are you holding up in these trying times? <laughs> oh, I'm doing great. Always trying. No, it's do or do not. <laughs> doing times. These doing times, I like that one. Want to see some of my plants while we wait? Nope. No. Why don't you just show us instead of asking? In these oh, showing respect, times. Respect your, your time. <laughs> Are you growing time? Because then it could no. be trying time. That would be funny. Uh, I should get some time, although I'm not sure it's my favorite herb. Just do it for the joke. Oh, right. That's a, that's a grape vine right there. Getting started. Been digging out my ditch and throwing all the dirt on my muddy driveway. These are doing the best. These are my uh, snap peas, sweet snap peas. And then these are wild onions. Why are they different from non-wild onions? Well, because I didn't plant them. Oh. Oh, I see. <laughs> wild. It came for free. Um, the wild onions should be pretty spicy. <laughs> they are. I've been just picking them up and eating them. <sighs> Definitely onions. <laughs> you can eat the tops, too. What do they taste like? Tastes like onions. Uh, that's crazy. Oh, my God. Blackberries coming in. Mm, yeah, you know, they're spicy. It's not all coming up yet, so we'll see. But I did like carrots and beets. And Love beets. Yeah, this has been hard work. I dig up this. If it's sandy, I throw it in this mud. And if it's clay, I add it right here. And I'm building up a bunch of clay that, oops, I forgot that's an amp pile. <laughs> that I can use, you know, a bunch of clay. I don't know. I just didn't want it in the road because that'll make it slippery. <laughs> I'll show you all what I'm I have some slides prepared. Slides? Well, papers. <laughs> I'll slide them up in front of the camera. <laughs> what What's the agenda? Like is this like is this more than just a hangout? <laughs> well, it's just a hangout, but like I wrote down on three pieces of paper to keep me on track. Sweet. For like hanging out, like you have a hangout agenda. <laughs> well, it's to form the Free Academy Trust, right? Oh, okay. Uh oh, yeah, man, you better get your brain ready for some intense work and uh, thinking. I thought that you were gonna take care of it, and I just have to sign a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> that is basically it. <laughs> but you might want to know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> okay. At least you can tell people when you're uh when you're like, Yeah, I'm on the board of trustees for the free academy and then they'll be like, Well, what does that mean? And then it'd be better if you're able to say like, Oh, that means I do blank and blank and we do blank. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay, well, have y'all heard of the Golden Circle? No. No? It's the best way to organize stuff. You start with why. Is it backwards for y'all? No. So. Um, sure, it was help ourselves and others. How? Okay. Uh, read backwards. Accept donations. Gifts and grants tax-free, or even better, give tax deductions to people for donating. And then what is the Free Academy Trust? So it's like, helps you organize your thoughts on why we're doing this, right? Because, <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot of paperwork and bullshit to jump through these hurdles. But there's some serious benefits at the end of the road. And um, so I think it's worthwhile. And furthermore, I think... You know, if anyone can build a charitable organization and do good with donated money, it's us, you know? Like, 
first off, we're all fucking frugal, which means we can make money go much further than the average person or the average institution. So, you know, I think uh, we'll be able to leverage our efficiency with money to do way more events than an equivalent group could. You know, like most charities put on these expensive things and, you know, we could just go to a park and have a lesson or come out to my land or, you know, other places like that. Okay, so why a trust though? You know, because there's lots of organizational structures to set up for a 501c3. Um, yeah, so actually let me start with 501c3 requirements. And it has to be organized as one and then operated exclusively for an exempt purpose. And luckily in the 501c3 uh, you know, verbiage, education is listed as an exempt purpose. So the advancement of education or science totally counts. So um, that's why I came up with that mission statement or purpose thing that was like, you know, crafted around education. Well, first off, that's what the whole thing's for, but I feel like it's the easiest of the 501c3 requirements to fulfill. Um, <clears throat> only a couple or one of the main things they worry about, though, is no lobbying or, you know, propaganda or like su supporting particular particular parties so we and like i especially would have to be careful to uh avoid talking about government and shit like we just i just have we'd have to separate that part of our lives okay so um um let me ask you yep um would that include conversations that i have with uh mouse belt university students around blockchain and uh like incidental mentions of um no because i mean uh that has for uh restructuring governments um or i like don't think so unless it's like a free academy function or something because obviously people who run 501c3s have their own personal political views and they're allowed to vote and talk to people about you know it just can't be on a free academy website or a free academy like youtube video you know yeah it's yeah. your own life yeah good but i was only thinking like um i only asked it in that way because i was thinking that um like one like i like i have access to a whole to a whole group of um to a whole group of uh, qualified individuals to like receive to like receive the benefits of you know any donation that we may get and so i'm so i'm just thinking that if i have conversations with them um that are sort of like grounded in their uh you know like um potential to receive um yeah benefits <laughs> from from the trust right so yeah, uh, like, that kind of how like how careful do you have to be there to like to like not talk about um, government? Um, I think so. Ultimately, everything's settled in the courts, so it's not like they have exactly like you're allowed one mention of government or something. But like my understanding when I read through it is they don't want a charity being used as a lobbying group. There's like specifically organizational structures like political action committees that if that's your goal you want to donate to an organization that's going to lobby for change then they want you to go through those routes and not try to use a 501c3 for you know something that would better be classified as you know a political action committee or some other organizational structure like that so um, that does kind of lead me into potential roles because uh, so far we've talked about being a trustee, but that's not the only role we could have. <laughs> so I'm imagining at least four. So trustees would be on the board of trustees and they'll actually make business decisions for the group. So that includes, you know, what to do with the money, like to put it in a savings account or a CD or invest in a stock, or to buy a piece of land. Um, those would be decisions made by the trustees, and it's a majority vote. I haven't looked up what happens if it's even, 
uh, we might have to write that in the bylaws, you know, whether it takes more than 50% or just 50% can make a choice. Um, but yeah, so like for instance, <clears throat> opening a bank account, that would be people, that would be something the board of trustees would have to do. But it, if people don't want to be that, we can also have employees of this organization. Um, so yeah, as a, as a trust, you're allowed to hire people to manage your operations. So like, let's say a tax accountant. Um, well, that would be a little different because that's not really an employee. That's one I, don't, I haven't read too much about, but I know it's an option. Um, and then we would just have volunteers. So volunteers wouldn't really have any authority to make decisions and they also wouldn't have any risk. Um, but you can contribute time and help the organization. And you know, that's, that's, you know what a volunteer is and then, uh, members. So I'm thinking it'd be smart for us to have, you know, um, okay. Especially if we're going to get into things like say we get a boat donated. Um, it'd be smart to have everyone sign up as a member, a free member of the organization before, you know, they get on the boat that could just, I don't know. I could just see it helping some, and you know, maybe members buy tickets to come to events, you know, for the fundraisers, stuff like that. So that's another role I would imagine people having where they just want to come to an event and learn some stuff. Maybe they bring their kid or something. And, you know, I'm picturing like barbecues with lessons kind of. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, members would be just like the member of a Falcon Point country club you know is they don't make decisions but they pay and they use the facilities that kind of thing okay uh oh i think i skipped over why a trust though because i said there's there's other forms of organization that would be qualified and basically it's because it's the easiest and one of the oldest and like established ways of doing it but it has the least requirements of the ones i could find so like we could set up a nonprofit corporation, which is different than a trust, um, but it has a lot more filing requirements. And, uh, and so, yeah, it just seems harder. And I'm not sure the, oh, well, okay. There's only one extra benefit I could find from doing a corporation versus a trust. And that is um, something about like retaining the interest that accrues or something. So like, as a trust, any money that you earn has to be paid, has to be spent on the beneficiaries. You know, um, you can't just grow the interest in your bank account forever. But that's not to say you can't keep receiving donations and have your bank account go up. Um, it's just called like excise tax or something. Or um, so it's like tax kind of like a capital gains tax where, okay, anyways, um, it's something I don't think is worth all the hurdles for us to be able to retain interest. Um, and if we need to later on, we can always change organizational structures. But anyways, all that was to say, I did some research and it seemed like a trust was the best way to go. Um, but, you know, if y'all do research too, we could potentially change that. <clears throat> Any, any questions on that one? <laughs> no. Nah. All right. Uh, okay. Fundraising. How are we going to get money in this bitch? So the easiest and first is private donations. So as a 501c3, well, once we get that letter from the IRS, then we can offer people the ability to deduct whatever they donate from their taxes. And so there's a huge part of the population that makes charitable contributions every year. And like I was saying with us being frugal, I think that money, that money is better, go, sh better off used by us than some of these larger institution where there's so much overhead and who knows how much money just goes to bullshit. You know, like we can be a lot more careful and efficient, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay. So yeah, private donations is, e well, it's, it's easy and obvious what that means. Uh, corporate donations and grants. 
corporations give out money to 501c3s left and right and all you have to do is apply and you have a chance at getting it and you know we're all really good essay writers i think so um i mean it's kind of like applying for scholarships and i did that plenty so i think we can come up with some good essays on why corporations should give us their money okay and then there's state and local governments and the federal government so there's all kinds of <clears throat> money out there and especially with the covid stuff like they're offering all kinds of grants right now and uh um so that's kind of part of the reason i was excited to jump on this you know train quickly because we've talked about it for years and uh it was fine as like a kind of fake institution, but hey, if filing a few papers can let us be bigger and power more powerful and do stuff, uh, I say why not? You know, um, yeah, I believe in us. So, so, um, so yes. then let's let's just say that we end up getting a grant from the um, federal government because mm -hmm. of COVID stuff, right? right now um what's the next step that we have to do after that like what do we yeah do i think grant money i think our very first money should go to hiring a tax person oh yeah that's that was number four down here is reporting um first step hire or we yeah, if we find a volunteer that's even better but say we get ten thousand dollars i say that's our first step is hire a tax person and um, have them help us with all the filing requirements from then on out. Um, and then what? And then, I mean, and then it's making prudent investments, basically. So uh, it can be as simple as just leaving it in a bank account. And actually, if it's a zero interest checking account, that kind of makes it easier um, because we won't have any interest accruing. So there would be none of this worry about uh, making sure we pass out all the interest that accrues. Um, so yeah, those would be the next steps if we get, or even before we get money, well, we have to make a banking account to get money, right? Um, and then that would be, I think, our first move. But, it, oh, I mean, we have to vote. I mean, the trustees would have to vote, you know, and... Yeah. So we would do a little research, figure out a good one, make an offer, I guess, or, you know, hire them and, um, and go from there, I guess, you know, so I have ideas on how we can spend money on assets and stuff and events, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, why not hire someone to make sure we're crossing all our T's and dotting our, all our I's? you know, maybe even like a legal 501c3 consultant or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, I mean, like, we can definitely use it to sort of fund us um, student travel to, like, blockchain conferences and stuff. So Hell yeah. I'm That's, like, uh, I'm sounds like thinking, really good, actually. Right, because I'm sort of thinking of ways in which we can use it as um, uh, um, uh, sponsorship funds for students in the mouse belt university program oh yeah okay that's cool because i mean look at how much sean benefited from attending that one bitcoin conference in new zealand i mean those yeah. can easily be you know inspirational turning points for students just to see you know stuff like that in action oh and actually there's another one this is <laughs> kind of unrelated but or well, kind of related but uh I can apply for a captain's license for free if I'm a volunteer for a truck or for a 501c3. And then people donate boats to 501c3s all the time. Um, and then we could take out people and have, you know, sailing lessons or just, you know, seamanship lessons or whatever. And, uh, and also fix up the boat. There's tons of stuff you can learn in the process of fixing a boat. And, uh, yeah, I thought the same about, I think I've already said this, but if we get an RV or car donated, um, we could host an event where people come out and, you know, help us fix it. Or it could even be a take apart kind of lesson. And then we sell the parts 
to add in to add revenue to the 501c3 depending on if it's good enough to fix or if it's you know mainly just good for parts at that point so so got ideas. what other sorts of benefits do we gain from it okay yeah so i mean one of the benefits is being able to let's say you want to just use some property then like I'm imagining we can have the trust own pieces of land and then each of us will be able to use it. And the land is an investment uh, that we're hoping will grow for the trust fund. But in the meantime, we could all use that land without, you know, taxes or without any personal um, money at stake or whatever. So that's uh, one benefit. I mean, another is our resumes. I mean, how, nice is it going to look to be on the board of trustees for a 501c3 charitable trust yeah. you know i think that sounds good um and i mean helping people we all care about education so you know actually enacting some of these changes that uh, we've talked about for years um you know instead of just talking and have a website where 10 people participate we could actually host events. I mean, all it takes is a little money and we could be doing a lot more. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Like if you have more funds to spend, you can do much more by way of outreach and then start to write, like do the things that put this on people's radar and they're like, Oh, I want to become a member of this, whatever that, means. whether it's signing up for a mailing list or whatever that means. Right. So yeah, like I said, the money also helps to just grow the base of people who you can reach um, for any given event or fundraiser or something like and that. And so then, if like we host an event with with this money, let's say, um, and we sell and we sell books at that event, like is that a conflict of interest or? Yeah, I was thinking about that one myself. I'm not sure. We'll have to look a little bit more at... Because it depends if you... I mean, if you own the copyright, then you can make money on the book. So, I mean, shit, maybe we set up a free market corner at the event and encourage everyone to bring, you know, any creative works they've made and then sell them. Um, I think the problem would be is if you use the trust to purchase the books with the trust money and then Tyler Olson sells the books and keeps the money. But if Tyler Olson buys the books and is just carrying them at a trust event, I don't think that's going to be any issue. You would just have to separate the income and make it not free Academy trust income. It'd be your personal income. I mean, um, if you even report a cash book sales, right? Yeah, yeah Jared, you got a question? <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Uh, it was just getting to what I was interested in, and then my phone got too hot because I'm working in the van, so it shut down on me. The last thing I heard was if, once, if we did get a grant, first thing to do is get in uh, a tax person. Can you guys just bullet point? there till now okay there you go um okay so yeah that was yeah the idea with the first money would be to find a tax person so that we can all sleep a little easier because yeah i've been doing shit tons of research but you know only for a week or whatever so somebody else can have more knowledge um okay and then i mean yeah i guess we said after that once we have a tax person then it's all about investing the money in a prudent way and they define prudence as like what a typical person would consider making a typical transaction in their personal life so you know buying a piece of land or um putting it in a bank or putting it in a crypto wallet i actually included that verbiage specifically uh in the trust um yeah, the next step would be deciding how to use the money or how to store it until we have like any kind of event or expenditures that we really want to, you know, maybe we want to put out pamphlets or who knows, you know, I don't know exactly what we would spend our money on next, but um, 
Yeah, because that would be my first recommendation as uh, a member uh, or as a um, someone on Trustee. the board of trustees uh, is I would I would sort of recommend that we don't hold it in a traditional bank account that we would sort of. Yeah, and so one of the things they mentioned on the IRS page is um, diversification is considered prudent. So, you know, we probably shouldn't put 100% in any one thing. And what they want to see is you're, la you're allowed to make bad investment choices. They can't punish you just for losing money. You know, if you invest in a stock and it goes down, that doesn't mean that's not a breach of trust or like uh, negligence or whatever. Um, they just want to see that there was some discussion and then a vote and what they don't want is, yeah, like, let's say there's a tiny company, Billy Bob's lawn mowing company, and they don't want us to put all hundred percent of our assets into Billy Bob's lawn mowing company. So we just have to meet some minimum requirements of diversification and like prudence. Just, I think an email amongst the trustees saying, I think this would be a good idea for this reason. Do you all agree? You know, and then we'd have that recorded. So yeah, that's, that's, I mean, the, the requirements aren't that stiff. Um, and really they don't even come out until there's a problem, right? It's yeah. not like everything's published. So can, um, so could we potentially, Let's just say that we uh, staked um, one third of it in uh, Tezos, one third of it in Bitcoin, and then like the other third either in the traditional bank account or in some other asset. Like, let's just run with the hypothetical. Yeah, I mean, that sounds good to me. Good. And then, and then uh, could we not do anything with it for five years? Yeah. Um, that's where I was saying the, it, the, Okay, the part I'm not sure on, because I know if the money grows, you have to pay excise tax. So I'm not sure how it counts with the crypto, because I think it's only when you make a transaction. So I think if you leave it sitting in a wallet, then you wouldn't have to do anything. But maybe the day you sell it or trade it, then we might have to either pay the excise tax or B, more preferably, use that money on an event. Or it doesn't have to be events. It could be anything. Buying books to hand out, you know, to students. Or we just have to spend the money on the beneficiaries. Yeah. If there's a, if there's interest, like capital gains, basically. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and that, yeah, and so, that makes sense. That's why. Hang on, I'm gonna mute y'all when you're not talking. Um. Yeah, that seems. Yeah, that's why I was asking if. Uh, yeah, because it makes sense that we'd have to pay something like akin to, you know, a capital gain once we end up liquidating it into some other form where we could then use it to sponsor an event or something like that or make any kind of transaction, even if you don't liquidate it for something else. But um, so that so that makes sense. But that's why I was wondering if um, if it mattered how long it sat in that wallet. Because um, even though we would end up having to pay something on it once we did something with it, I just wanted to be sure that we didn't have to, you know, every year be proving that we're, you know, putting money that we have in the trust to some sort of event. No, I'm pretty sure you're allowed to hold an asset in the trust as long as you want. Like real estate's a perfect example. Um, you know, they don't. Yeah, you can buy a property and hold it for 10 years um, hoping that, you know, you make money on it. Yeah. And when you go to sell it, you either need to spend all that money that you, all the profit within the next year or pay an excise tax. Yeah. That's my understanding from my research at least. So that seems like the best thing to do because then it's like, we don't even have to fuss with it. You know, what I'm going to recommend as, as a trustee is to say like, look, if we, if we get a grant from the federal government for our 501 C three, 
we should put it like we should put a third of it into Bitcoin, a third of it into Tezos and a third of it into something else that we can collectively agree on. But but sort of but sort of hold those assets for at least five years so that they can so that they can uh, so that like basically we can leverage it against the volatility of those assets so that in five years time we can, you know, whatever, five X the amount of the initial grant and then really be in a position to start doing things. You know, I don't, you know, I don't mind waiting five, like five years to have much more money. Yeah. So my thoughts on that are one of the thirds should definitely be a business checking account so that we can use and receive more funds. Cause I don't think this is going to be one grant. Uh, oh, oh yeah. The other thing is grants usually come with their own requirements. So there's the 501c3 requirements to be eligible, but then if we apply for like a teaching autistic kids grant, you know, you can't just hold the money. They're going to want you to do something. So yeah, but that's the easy, you know, like we can just like, you know, give it like, you know, fun, you know, fund the travel of one student. Yeah. Uh, we probably want to be careful of making more than one, but yeah. <laughs> I'm going to add yep. to that. There's contingencies with grants, so it really just depends on uh, who like, who you're requesting the grant from and what, what you agree to do as a result of the grant. So, you know, it's, it's like if Cisco gives you like 3,000 computers or a big stipend to do something, they're not going to want you to just do like one kid. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be clear whenever we uh, we draft the grant and, and send it to them for approval, what we're asking for, what we're going to deliver as a, you know, on our end of doing the grant. So I just wanted to add that it's not going to be something so like they're going to give us $100,000 and we can use 5000 and then save the rest of it on something. Uh, that's just from my uh, perspective of working with that nonprofits before. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, so yeah, it'll be diverse and that's why I was saying there's corporate grants and yeah, different ones. So each of them will have their own requirements. And so another thing we should probably consider is like a compliance officer, you know, either hiring or finding a volunteer compliance officer who is going to read all this stuff and double check all our actions and make sure we're recording what needs to be recorded. And, um, yeah, because none of us want to get in trouble. There's a lot of opportunities here, and the risks are pretty minimal, I think. But, you know, let's just follow every step. You know, other people can do this, then we can do it and uh, help both ourselves and others. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> Y'all have any other ideas? So I was uh, thinking of a couple things while we were talking about that. I don't think there's a problem with, uh, I think it's a good idea to uh, diversify. Um, but I do recall that there's some depreciation of assets that we had to report. Um, for example, when we got like thousands of computers, we had to report whenever the computers depreciated in value and that affected how much um, that affected how much assets we were holding as a nonprofit. Uh, so this might be something we, if we have enough money to hire a tax consultant or a compliance officer, something that they can help us out with. Um, and it also might have been because we were a, we were probably a nonprofit corporation, and we were getting audited on a yearly basis because we're bringing in millions, millions and millions of dollars. So that might be something we might never see if we're starting out small. Um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff we're going to want to check with uh, either research it ourselves or check with a compliance officer or tax consultant. Um, and the other thing we were talking about the, uh, uh, what is that, cryptocurrency? I, I don't know if we could just hold it and then only report it whenever um, whenever we use it. I there might be something where you have to report it as the value of it changes while it sits in that. As you know, as the currency goes up and down, we might have to report it say on a yearly basis. That's just another thing we'd have to check uh, with that compliance officer. 
yeah, that's a that's a good point. I haven't done a ton of res I haven't done much research on crypto holdings for a five one C three. So that I might even be like a whole new ballpark, you know. <clears throat> um but actually other options are to have a another organization basically hold our money and invest it for us. You know, that was in the rules. It's like you're allowed to what what do they call them? Like a custody or fiduciary. Like we can hire another firm to actually serve as our um investing group so i'm not sure if that's a good idea but i know they said it's an option um so so i guess um i mean have y'all so i've tried to file for the bank account and i'm running into this problem where they want the articles of formation and i sh sent them this you know, excerpt from the Secretary of State of the State of Texas saying most nonprofits don't need to file certificate of for formation. Um, but the bank was like, well, we only serve nonprofit corporations, which do have to file. So I'm trying to find a bank right now that will take us as an unincorporated nonprofit. Um, so that's my my latest step, and I've been doing a lot of research trying to figure out which one will let us do it. But uh, let's so see. What's the, what's the benefit of having a specific business uh, checking account or banking account? I mean, how's people going to donate to us if we don't have a checking account? Yeah. So I mean, but does it have to be a specific, you know, business oh. account? Um. Well, I don't think we can have a personal account for an organization. I think business, you know, just means not a personal account. Okay, Some of them so have like a page for nonprofits specifically. Okay. So basically instead of the holder being a person, it's going to be an entity like this. Right. Okay. And it'll just so that on the checks, it'll say the free Academy trust and on the debit card, it'll say free Academy trust. And when somebody writes us a check, we don't want it writing to our personal names. We want to be able to take a check that says free Academy yeah. trust. Right. Yeah, definitely. No, that definitely gets into some uh, some problems if you are taking personal checks. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. So, um, so yeah. So those are the next steps: are creating the bank and then filing with the five hundred one c three. They have this process for small uh, charities called like Easy Ten Twenty Three. Um, that's the form that you have to fill out and you can do it all online. Um, I guess I'll go through that today and see what you have to upload. Cause I think that's where you're going to have to upload a signed declaration of trust. So I think that's when we'll really need signatures is to file for the 501c3 exemption. And also, Oh, there was another thing about, um, Here, by the way, I yeah. know. Oh, um, certainly. Yeah. Um, we are, uh, so like it would be considered an unincorporated trust. So a trust like, whatever is the type status is that the bank needs. What did you say? Sorry, it's just clarification. Oh, unincorporated nonprofit association. Okay, because I can ask my sister of her bank. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, that's what she should do. Yeah, good thinking. Because she's Chase, right? No. Oh. But she's a Texas bank. Yeah. That'll help. Because some of these I've been looking at don't serve Texas, so. Oh, yeah, that was another thing about, okay, so there's 501c3 is federal requirements, right? But they rely on states to set the organizational standards. So we would file the trust under Texas state law and then apply for the 501c3 exemption with the federal government. And so we need the bank to allow the trust 
basically. And the bank doesn't care about the 501c3 thing. I mean, they may want it down the road, but you can form a trust without it being a 501c3. Okay, but, but like, I just need to know specifically what to ask my sister. Yeah, I'll text it to you. I'll text you some yeah, words. Yeah, because mo most trusts aren't uh, uh, charities. Most trusts are like ways for people to pass down certain assets and inheritance and things like that, or uh, put up restrictions when you pass inheritance to people on age and things like that so they don't get it while they're too young and blow it on cocaine. See, we all have little bits of knowledge, and that's what's going to make this all come together. Yeah, I was going to say, because we like to help people with trusts. Um, I mean, I didn't set them up personally, but like I used to help people. Like when I used to manage people's money, that was a big part of uh, inheritance planning is organizing trusts. But it's different with charity, and that's like a black hole I know very little about. One of my concerns real quick, or my initial concern was one that we've kind of touched on, but you know, I don't know. I imagine it's going to be like a small side project here and there for us, and so I just don't want to to get overly involved and then expose ourselves to a lot of risk or liability or, you know, issues with the government when it's just like a small thing that we're having fun with. And it sounds like everyone's on the same page with that, but I guess that's my, everything else I'm pretty much on board with so far, but that's my big concern is like taking on governmental risk for this side project. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so some of the like, ways out or like uh it's in the in the declaration of trust that any uh board member any trustee can resign at any time with written notice and then also um we can fold the whole charity uh the requirement is just that we would donate it to another 501c3 exempt organization and we can actually make another one and then donate all the funds from this one to that one if say we figured out that maybe a nonprofit corporation was a better idea than a trust like maybe not at the beginning but maybe down the road it's gonna be a better idea so we could always create that corporation send all the money from this one to that one and then fold this one so there's ways of modifying and editing it down the line oh and I mean if we want to amend any of the articles it just takes a majority vote by the trustees so we could change the verbiage you know if um i don't know maybe the irs writes us back and says that our beneficiaries is not um well enough defined or something you know then we would just need to have the board vote to amend you know the um the defined beneficiaries or the mission statement or whatever and record the vote. I mean, I think this can all be on our own paperwork. It doesn't even have to go anywhere. I would think emails would be fine. Um, I think so. I would I think want something to record it. But, yeah, um, I was counting it as written documentation. Yeah. But anyways, so, okay. And then I put in there as much as I could about, like, uh, like they had some words about, exculpating all trustees from liabilities um so the thing is you can't you can't just write in there that like <laughs> trustees are allowed to embezzle funds like ultimately that's going to be illegal if you take trust funds and give them to yourself but i think there's plenty of ways to safeguard ourselves well make sure no, that, no. if that's it i fuck it i'm out <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's ways of safeguarding ourselves and making sure. And that's why, you know, I said, to, I think I said to Jared, like, by having a bunch of smart people working on it, we can each make sure that we're not going to get in trouble. You know, obviously, part of the reason is for, to benefit ourselves, you know, I think, like, but there's no reason we can't benefit ourselves by having these events where we teach people, you know, I love barbecues and 
<laughs> have the opportunity to get on stage and teach people about space missions or something. And, and if we can use donor funds to do that, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's actually a great use of time and resources. So if all it takes is filing some paperwork to uh, enable us to do that, then that's why I'm so motivated. Because, I mean, every time I hang out with all you guys, we learn a shit ton from each other. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of making it more institutionalized, I guess. So. Which, that part sucks. Woo! But I guess it's a necessary step in order for us to be able to get any money from other institutions. Yeah. And even private donors. Cause I mean, nobody donated to the free Academy before. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, it said free. So it's kind of hard when you just like, Hey, I am the free Academy. Can you hear me some money, please? <laughs> Don't worry. I'll use it for good. <laughs> Well, I mean, the freeze in the name, so people aren't thinking that they need to give any money to it. Right. Well, we should emphasize it's free because. <laughs> right. Well, I think the charity makes that yeah go away, but the uh, when it was just dudes. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah. yeah. Irrevocable charitable trust. <laughs> on a end. separate point, there though. It's like, why is it that the first thing people think of, or I'm not saying that you did or that anybody does, but why do you think one would be inclined to hear the free academy and think like, um, the no, like the no cost academy? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I guess, think of it as both for sure. Free as in beer and free as in speech. For sure, yeah. I think most people associate free just on average. I think people think cost first before they think freedom. I think an average person, maybe not the people who'd be interested in participating. Yeah. So I think maybe that's why. But because I mean, if you're seeing it's free academy and you're just playing along when it was just a website, maybe uh, you know no one's going to donate when it says. But I think in this sense, once it's a charity free takes on the other meanings. Yeah. Oh, it smells like alcohol. Wait, I have a question. It, it, well, I think. Oh, sorry. Like with respect to this. You can go ahead. Of, of like free, free, like free in the context of like free speech. That brings up a good point. I'm wondering that if it's the case that we accept like federal funds, does that limit or constrain the, 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 the extent of the freedom of speech? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're, if you're sort of entering into some sort of agreement by taking their money, does this mean, okay, well, this now, you are not allowed to talk about, or I think you touched on this, right? Like you can't, obviously you can't like use the money to donate to political campaigns and do sort of lobbying and stuff. But I wonder, aside from that, does it like limit the kind, some of the kinds of things that you can talk about and can say? Well, I, w I would so, imagine each, uh, each grant probably has limitations and most of them probably don't constrict free speech, but I think anyone who hands you money under a grant can put whatever restrictions that they want on it. Yeah. That was basically what I was going to say too. The only one I know that's like a federal thing blanket for all 501 C threes is no political lobbying. Mm -hmm. But um, beyond that, it's kind of like, don't bite the hand that feeds you. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, that's my guess but then again any ones that we feel the restrictions are too limiting or against the principles we could i mean we just want to apply for those grants i guess that's the i don't know yeah no yeah i think that's my understanding and then yeah like so obviously they can't um restrict us from having opinions so I think the key would be like if you're speaking on behalf of the free Academy, like if the board of trustees comes up with a memo that we're going to send to all the members, we're going to need to be more careful than <clears throat> if you're just speaking about your own beliefs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I get it. I get it. Um, so the right. motivate, another question I had, which I think you might have answered, Mike, was like, um, and I think the answer was COVID. What what generated all this momentum right right now, this second? You think it's, is it COVID and just the fact that they've, there's a lot of grants. Uh, no, I mean, me and Gung on the sailboat trip, we're talking a bunch about it. And, um, you know, I don't know. Really, the question is what's taken me so long? And it's probably laziness. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, but, yeah, I mean, that's part of the motivation right now is there is a lot of opportunities. And I'm sitting here in my trailer. I don't have any uh, other people's work to do. I have videos to edit and books to work on but uh yeah i mean that's a lot of the motivation for me is i have time right now and so why not <laughs> yeah it's good reason good reason <laughs> i was just um, curious no yeah i mean the covid thing yeah go ahead Tim. I was, I was just going to say, for my part, on talking about it on the sailboat, I think when we were talking about it, I was telling you that I, uh, I enjoy teaching and would do it for free. Uh, obviously, I can't do that when, you know, I need to pay for my bill and do certain things. Um, and so I'm going to choose the ones that pay me money over people that need it for free. But that's where a nonprofit could come in, where it allows me to teach. And the, the people that might need it the most, the ones that can't afford it, they won't have to pay because that's being donated or uh, sponsored by corporations. So personally, that's where um, I kind of fell in on this uh, nonprofit spectrum where, where it can help me and help people that I want to help most rather than rich people that can afford it anyway. Yeah, man, that sounds awesome. And actually, that brings up another thing we had talked about on the boat is like making a marketplace for private tutors to be able to meet and teach um, students, you know, and especially it, that could be where the word free really comes into play, like free tutoring for the students um, paid for by donors. And so our tutors and our teachers do make money but it doesn't come from the students. It comes from rich private donors who have more money than they know what to do with. And so, yeah, it's a, we can be that bridge from, from the rich people who want a tax deduction to the kids who can't afford a tutor, but who really want one or could benefit from one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see. Any other thoughts, you guys? Oh, I did have another one, actually. <clears throat> so there's this thing of, uh, this is kind of more of a technical, like, paperwork part. But um, for the Texas Trust, you can appoint an agent of service or of process who is, like, named as the person who will receive any paperwork. Let's say the trust was to get sued or... I mean, there's this other thing where it says once up to every four years, the secretary of state may ask you to file like a list of the people on the board and it said it won't necessarily ask you for it, but they can. And uh, so that would be sent to the agent of service of process. So I can volunteer to be that person. Um, it'd be kind of an interesting way for me to kind of once again shield the trustees. So like that's part of the reason for me to be settler or donor, the first donor or whatever, like in the trust, because uh, that's usually the person who would sue the trustees for breach of trust. And so I can know and guarantee and probably y'all have a very high confidence that I won't sue you. And so having me be that person, um, yeah, it kind of sets up a shield. And then vice versa, the trustees kind of form a shield for the members of the organization um, to be able to use all these funds and, I don't know, I guess know that the filing requirements and the compliance stuff is being taken care of. And less, like, like I said, that's why we need to hire someone right off the bat. You know, if there's actually money in this, let's hire someone, 
even if year one, we net zero because we make five grand and we pay five grand to a tax attorney, like it might be worth it, especially to get the ball rolling properly. better that's better okay uh what i was gonna say is so part of uh the goal of this would that be to do what you guys i think just mentioned the idea of providing free tutoring or teaching to the students um you know but the tutors could be paid via the trust right yeah totally i think that's I an excellent than just tutors but what if we structured like the beginning to get off the ground to just like to one justify funds, but also to provide you know instant obvious value to people who participate? You could essentially one of the functions could just be providing free tutoring to people who need it in whatever subjects, and then the trust pays whatever tutoring you have. Uh, Dude, yeah, I think that's a great first step for us because um, it's it's quantifiable, you know, it's e easy to measure. Shit, we could even have the kids sign something or like the parent sign something saying, I received X, so many hours of tutoring, you know, and then we'd have... If it works out, we can ask for testimonials and stuff. I mean, but it'd be... And I think it would be a very honest, you know, that'd be a very honest a way to give back. And, uh, you know, and then we could, that could be one function, but we could have all the other functions which we're talking about too, like meetups and barbecues and open mics and whatever fun we want to have. But just the tutoring aspects might get them, get them off the ground and give us a legitimacy and also give all of us like, you know, that good feeling of sense of purpose or like that this is actually doing something and then the, the less tangible or more abstract portions of the charity, uh, you know, can kind of follow up with those secondary after we have this uh, maybe as like a starting point. Yeah, I'm totally in favor. And that's another reason why I think <clears throat> right now is a great time to act because so many kids are trapped at home, so many parents want them to have access to some kind of tutor and you know not everyone can afford it may not have jobs. May, yeah exactly may not have the money and also yeah especially right now. right now and the schoolwork well i think it's going to be for a while so i mean i think right you're right this is a good time but uh also a lot of kids they're not really doing much schoolwork per se because the grades can't matter that much but hold on a sec i got an order from the grocery Yeah, that's, no, I think that's uh, a great idea for <clears throat> like our first steps. And <laughs> obviously we can do it. We can be the first tutors and be volunteers and then uh, try to bring on other people. So that brings up employees. And I know you have to be careful with a 501c3 having employees. There's different filing requirements. So that would be one to, uh, we have to really double check before we start paying anyone to work for the organization. I know it's legal and it's possible, but I know it adds some, um, some more reporting requirements. Maybe Gung, you could, do you know something about that? Um, what's well, tricky, uh, typically, typically, the board members of the nonprofit I worked for, they did not work for the nonprofit at all. They, at most, in the biggest capacity, they would be volunteers and simply offer their time to help out or whatever, uh, help fundraise and stuff like that. But they did not, they were not on the employee payroll of the nonprofit. So it kept the interests uh, separated. So, um, yeah, that's tricky for like, for example, for me, if I want to be on the board making decisions and also if I want to be paid to do the tutoring, 
I don't know how we could separate that. Um, I don't, I mean, if it's possible that I get paid as a board member uh, or not paid as a board member and also get paid as a tutor, like, I would do that, but I'm not sure if, like, in the eyes of the IRS or the law, they would, they could see it that way. I think there would be a conflict of interest. But, That's pretty much my understanding, too, is you'd kind of, you you'd kind of have to pick one. I know the trustees can pay themselves for reasonable expenses, but I don't think that's the same as being an employee of the 501c3. So that's one we would definitely have to double check before we start paying anyone for their time. Um, yeah, I think, I think those are probably having to be, uh, I don't think you could be both in my, I mean, from I've never done this before, obviously, but I've had I've known some people who've had charities, and that I remember that being something. But they were able to pay themselves, I guess, a, a reasonable salary or something out of it. So you'd have to pick your. You can't get paid both ways, I guess. And we wouldn't be able, to, and there wouldn't be a reasonable salary for us to pull off of no funds or very little funds too. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess like I'm thinking at first we do volunteer tutoring until we really think, well, obviously we have to have money coming in before we can even pay anyone, but we could start by offering free volunteer tutoring. I don't think we need, well, I mean, unless you just want to, and we don't actually have to start grow the brand. anything. Um, I don't think we have to start doing anything until we get some money. Um, but that's up to you guys. But I think we could easily hold back, apply for grants with the, you know, saying that that's the intent or apply for grants where they're based on tutoring or that sort of thing. And then not actually do any or do much activity until we have the funds. But because we're not misappropriating any funds or yeah. wasting time when we don't even have the funds. So. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, this is definitely just formational kind of brainstorming. But I do think the idea of, uh, you know, free tutoring is a great um, starting place, you know, and uh, it kind of helps organize the ideas about, because I know it sounds very wishy-washy when I say, oh, we'll have events and like bring people out and just teach them stuff, you know, so... No, that makes it more precise and exact and well-defined. And I think that'll help a lot with applying for all these trusts and exemptions and stuff. So, um, and yeah, obviously we don't have to do it until there's money, right? <laughs> I mean, people understand that. You can't do anything without money. <laughs> yeah, the only plus side. Go ahead, dude. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um the only plus side of having something out, like say we do like a video, like a free tutoring video or something, or, or a couple free ones, it would just to give people an idea of what they could get. And that, that would maybe stir up some interest for some donors. You know, like, oh, I like this style of tutoring and, and I'd like to see that uh, be given to kids that need it or whatever. That's the only reason I would say to do it before we actually got money. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, I definitely have educational videos from my history that I could uh, post. We have the Free Academy YouTube page still. I don't have a domain anymore, but we should get another one up and running soon. But yeah, I mean. Probably, because of the government restrictions that you brought up earlier, you probably, you probably have to look through those Free Academy videos and filter, uh, like turn a lot of them private. Um, yeah, just a random thought. Like squatting in the woods. Like squatting in the woods. Yeah, like all the ones that may uh, may not represent our our uh, desire to get grants very well, and all the ones that might, you know, have negative government things, uh, given the restriction there. Yeah, like I was thinking of one I did where it was the size of the solar system to scale. You know, pretty, pretty uh, mild mannered. <laughs> Yeah, 
but uh, I'm sure I could go back through and find some stuff and. Yeah, fucking Kylie doesn't even know shit about the Free Academy Live. <laughs> live? Yeah. What did you guys do on live? Oh, we God. used to like. Oh, we had about twenty episodes back we, in the day. Oh, bro, okay. like we you got, showed me. You showed me some of them. Did I? Yeah, we literally like a week ago. <laughs> No. We sat there and watched it, and you, yeah, and you were like, this is, like, from, like, fucking seven years ago, or whatever. Which and one? You had all that hair. No, 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 that isn't Free Academy Live. That was, like, that predates that. That was Michael's idea. He's like, let's send videos back and forth to each other. I'll ask you a question. Got it. That was kind of the, kind of the start of it. <laughs> it was the appetizer. Yeah. The free yeah, exactly. Academy Live. Hey, I mean, we could get those rolling again. What? This is the one Jared was on back in the day, huh? Oh, here's the one with Matt Larry where y'all scared him hey off. Guys, uh, welcome to <laughs> this episode. No, he didn't scare him off. It's just like, there's only so much shit you can take when you feel like you're being ganged up on. I believe we're super eight. excited. Uh, eight episode eight. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, we're super excited uh-huh. to uh, have on uh, a new guest named Matt here that uh, we haven't had on before, <laughs> and then we also got Daniel on with us as well. He's been on a few, and of course Daniel. Michael Fooling and Jared Gray is on here. And today uh, we're going to talk at least at first a little bit about minimum wage, um, and then probably that that might be a short conversation. And then and like this is all going to be super diplomatic, and then like and then like the first anti-libertarian thing that Matt says, they're just like, oh yeah, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you're like, oh, totally, all ideas are welcome. He's like, well, dude, I think Bernie Sanders. They are like, oh, so so basically, like, what is human integrity? Why would you just assume that there is such a thing? Transition How stupid are you? Uh, Actually, probably a good example of something we shouldn't discuss under the Free Academy heading ever again. <laughs> so, like, um, from the discussion that I've been sort of listening to so far, it, um, is there, like, a mission statement that we should have? Is there, like, a scope that, like, we should sort of, like, narrow in on? Or how broad is the scope of what What's we're doing, right? Because it's, like, tutoring and events. And, like, is there something that you, like, I guess, right, it's the this idea that we are helping or trying to make, uh, make resources accessible to those who... Um, under por- perform in under porn, under porn form in traditional under porn. environments. Like that's the broad, <clears throat> that's the broad thing, right? Um, yeah. So there's, I think, advantages to keeping it pretty vague, so it leaves us more options moving forward. Right. But we want to make sure we fall under the five hundred one c three requirements. Um, so the exempt purpose, you know, they specifically say educational and for the advancement of education. So here's, you know, and this is open for debate, but this is what I wrote is the charitable, charitable purpose of the free Academy irrevocable charitable trust is to offer education to students who underperform in traditional learning environments. So that means the beneficiaries of the trust are students who underperform in traditional learning environments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, tutoring, private tutoring fits perfectly in there. Like, that's Ah. not a traditional learning environment. It's either one-on-one or small groups. It's, you know, at your own time, at your house. So basically, anyone, it's it's just outside of uh, typical schools, you know? And so anyone who believes they're underperforming would count. I think by that definition, which can be anyone from mentally ill to, I think the most intelligent underperform the a lot too. So it really opens the door for anyone who doesn't just maximize their potential in a, in a regular school. Yeah. What if we, what if we broadened it to say those who underperform in traditional uh, learning environments, or are looking to further their education 
outside of those institute traditional institutions or something something about not just for if you're struggling or you're uninterested but also just for people who want to continue education outside of or fully focus on education outside of traditional forms. I don't know the That's, best way to phrase it, but yeah, um, we can definitely work on that language. Um, so part of the being a charity, okay, let me read this other thing they said. Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, they mentioned things about the underprivileged or, you know, serving. So that's why the underperform language is kind of like to make it about helping people that are worse off. Yeah, what about But it was ambiguous enough. Right? People who are also underserved and like they just don't have the right kinds of resources to learn. And so underperform and underserved, right? So um, I think that's that a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah, you know, I, I said students specifically to include people of all ages. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think she brought up a good point. Um, but also, uh, we kind of, uh, the mission statement doesn't really have to be uh, laser focused, I don't think, at least in the beginning. Because mm -hmm. um, you can gear you can change your mission statement to be more laser focused for the kind of the people you're pitching the grant to the right. grant request to. And, uh, so like, for example, what Jared said, that, that whole outside of the traditional institutions, you wouldn't want to say that to a college or, or some, um, some, somebody that's really into the traditional institution system. You wouldn't want to make a grant request to them saying something like that. Um, but you could, you know, you could gear it to the specific places that you're asking for money from. Um, and yeah, so, so our mission statement, I think, should just be enough to get us, get us the approval of the 501c3 mm -hmm. status. And uh, yeah, and if we have trouble getting money, then we might have to regroup and think how, how can we improve this mission statement so that people give us money. Hey, do you have the mission statement from your 501c3 that you worked for? Oh, I mean, they're they're online, right? I mean, they still have a website up and everything. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, we can take a look at all those. Yeah, and we even worked with a lot of, uh, we worked with a lot of other nonprofits that, that raise a lot of money too. So we could look at all, you know, all other, yeah. And in fact, for myself, when I was making my own website, I just like looked at other people's sites that did well and looked at what their mission statement was and you know kind of mimic the quali qualities that I liked of, of the other people that did well but yeah I can I can text that uh, I can text that to anybody else interested um, yeah maybe I'll and make I also, a Google Doc too what on the note here? of uh, sorry on the note of um the tutoring thing go does go really well with the mission statement that you already wrote, Mike. So in that regard, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a great start, I think. And I like that uh, this can easily be kind of supplemental to existing institutions. So we're not saying we're trying to pull the kids out of traditional learning environments. We're just offering education to those who underperform so yeah I don't know um, yeah we can definitely think about it but I think less is more probably you know at this point oh and uh, just so you all know this declaration of trust comes straight from the IRS website there's a draft you know draft for it and then I just changed a few things added our purpose and um, yeah, that's about it, but it's 98% like still the original. Great. So um, I might, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. She said, do we need a constitution, bylaws? That's what the Declaration of Trust basically is. Okay. Say it again. That's what the Declaration of Trust basically is. 
She's in the She's bathroom, in the so I sent her a... <laughs> so, uh, Relay. I might... On the pot. So, uh, I might have to go soon, but uh, my thoughts... Because uh, a lot of the things I think we've discussed today might be, like, future. Like, a little further in the future things. I guess for now, the thing is if, if everyone's on the same page that we have minimized the risk enough that it's worth putting our names for and moving this forward um, I'm thinking that we should probably have like two at least two shared folders on like Google Drive or something where we can all look at the documents uh, one folder I think should be for the things that you're actually gonna send in um, so that we can like look at it and make sure we're not signing our lives away or uh, putting um, unwanted liability on us. And uh, yeah, so I would say like have an official folder with the official channel of things that are actually gonna be seen by the IRS and stuff. And then we can have like a brainstorming or unofficial channel um, where we can discuss ideas that we wanna implement or things that we want to accomplish, but we're not sure how to word it in the eyes of the law or IRS and uh, all that. So that's my, I think that would be the next best step to, to get started. That sounds perfect, man. I can uh, definitely work on that. Put the stuff I've already drafted in there. Um, yeah, I mean, if everybody's good with Google Drive, I'll just do it on there. Works for me. Yeah. Sean can just go fuck himself. <laughs> that guy's not even a U.S. citizen. Fuck him. <laughs> uh, no, that sounds perfect. Yeah, I was just getting a call. That's why it muted me. Um, but, I mean, otherwise, I think we covered a lot of ground for an informal meeting. Uh, we could put some stuff on the Internet and brainstorm and maybe do another one in, like, a week or something. Yeah. yeah good hangout with slides paper slides yeah yeah thanks good old-fashioned work... slides studies computer for hours on those yeah <laughs> goes to college for computer science at a top institution <laughs> and fucking still fucking draw stick 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 figure bridges oh, <laughs> this is my homework <laughs> Yeah, good. <laughs> it looks like about as much effort as you put into your homework. <laughs> hey, I got all A's. <laughs> <laughs> For a while. Um, but yeah, that sounds yeah. good to me. Well, cool, guys. Thanks for participating. And uh, look forward to working with you guys, man. It's going to be fun. Yep. I'm pretty excited. Not all too my, much of a headache. All my initial concerns... Uh, I, you know, I feel a lot better after talking to you guys about it's it. Lodged, and, it's lodged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, people do this shit all the time. So, like, right. So, like, without, like, we don't have any malicious intent. And as long as we're not set on, like, doing anything fraudulent, like, we can yeah. do what many people do all the time. I would think so. I mean, my mom set one of these up for our lacrosse team so <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah i think we can do it. i was more just trying to make sure everyone's intent was like in the same place that we didn't like this was just like something fun and exciting <laughs> so, like like it has been in the past but also to yeah. make sure this wasn't just like some sort of money grab that we were trying to like siphon out of you know yeah and then like do a whole do a whole work around where like we end up yeah. Uh, I guess basically that's what embezzlement is, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that's, what I was worried about. that's also part of the reason. So I can't ever receive income from it being the original settler. So, uh, I mean, but I'm okay with that. You know, uh, the, the worst I want to do is like take home the extra food from our events and like, you know, <laughs> we own some land in Colorado for like, an asset of the trust. I want to be able to go hang out there. Like that's all I'm really looking for personal gain out of this. Yeah. Or I'll just end up getting 
the money and then I'll just sort of uh, give you a birthday like like extra there you go present. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think that present. might be the broad part of it but uh, you know we'll, we'll figure it out <laughs> is it though yeah maybe we'll get some money before we start worrying about how to spend it <laughs> we're, we're, well, we'll make sure you don't starve, Mike. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Sure. Yeah, I got wild you onions. Have a good birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me one of them free boats. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna take. All right, off. guys. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, sounds good. Guys. All right. Good to see you guys. Yeah, man. Peace out. Adios. Talk to you again soon. Let's do Bye, it, everybody. Later. All right. Later. You're gonna get me in fucking trouble. You can't funnel and embezzle money. It says campaign, paid by the park. That's illegal. And it's my ass.